I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. I'm delighted to welcome co-authors of the new book, Dirt Road Revival, How to Rebuild Rural Politics and Why Our Future Depends on It. These authors are Chloe Maxman and Canyon Woodward. Senator Maxman hails from rural Maine, and she's the youngest woman ever to serve in the Maine State Senate. She was elected in 2020 after unseating a two-term Republican incumbent. In 2018, she served in the Maine House of Representatives after becoming the first Democrat to win a rural conservative district. Uh, Canyon was born and raised in rural North Carolina and Washington. He was the campaign manager for Senator Maxman's successful 2018 and 2020 campaigns. Welcome to you both. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. Uh, let me start with you, um, Chloe. As a senator representing rural issues, um, what's changed in your mind since you were first elected in terms of what's most important to the rural voter we're here in 2022 anticipating these midterm elections? So I'm curious, just in your mind, what, if anything, has changed since you were first elected? That's such a good question. I think that my identity and approach as a progressive and a Democrat has really evolved since I started to have a lot of in-depth conversations with Republicans and independents, many of whom had never been contacted by a Democratic candidate or canvasser in their entire voting history. And having these conversations with folks who approach the world and the crises that we faced in really different ways also changed my perspective on, on these critical issues. And I think the biggest thing that I learned is that on many issues, maybe not all of them, but we we have common ground. We, we often share the same values. I've never met anyone of any party who wants healthcare to be more expensive. We just approach these issues in really different ways. And being able to connect on those values on those values on that deeper level has given me a lot more empathy and understanding for, for folks who think differently than I do, which is uh, just part of being human. And I've really tried to translate that kind of empathy into the ways that I approach my bills and the legislative process. Canyon, from the experience of, of campaigning, what do you think has changed as someone who was strategically focused on how can we connect with voters going to 2018 through the present now in 2022, the way that you would implore campaign managers across the country to think about representing rural constituencies, um, in your mind, what has changed, if anything? I think in my mind, one of, one of the biggest things that stands out is the opportunity to bring people on board with progressive candidates through face-to-face -face conversations, if we take the time to go door to door and actually interact in person, especially coming off of the isolation of the pandemic and, and how rampant disinformation has become through social media, through Fox News and conservative radio. Um, I, I really think that the, the most effective way that we can that we can reach people is by getting campaigns that they get off of stop spending their whole budgets on consultants on overpriced tv ads and actually go and have face-to-face -face conversations with folks and build those relationships because that's really what we haven't been doing as a party and as progressives and um that's that's what we were so successful in in our campaigns and i think that's really um the way forward Chloe, are you anticipating that the success you had in 2018 and 2020 will be repeated in 2022? I'm actually not running for office again. I'm, I'm turning my focus and attention to supporting other folks like me and Canyon who are running for office and seeking those tools and resources to really get into office in these really tricky different districts and also make it something sustainable because... It's a lot of work, um, but I've been helping a lot of local candidates and doing a lot of deep canvassing trainings in Maine, and we're working with folks all across the country. And I think the need for this face-to-face, -face, deep canvassing, values-based, like kind of nonpartisan model is more needed than ever as things get really, really divisive. Because if we can't bridge these divides, then 
um, it's going to be really scary where our country ends up in terms of our fights for reproductive justice, racial justice, climate justice. These, these things are dependent upon electing people who share the values of that, of those fights for justice. And we can't get there unless we're, we're talking to people face to face during every single election. But I, su- I suppose the question is still top of mind for, for you as you consider your legacy and the impact you've had these past four years in, in terms of what if you had run, if you were running for re-election, um, if you think there would still be that middle ground that you forged and occupied during the 2018 and 2020 contests. Yes, I definitely think that I, I think of it as common ground, not middle ground, because I don't think there's any, you know, compromise on on any side in terms of our values. But there is so much space to meet in the middle, and it's been, you know, it's been a priority for me to actually represent my district and not vote party line and not to get sucked into party politics and to be very present in my community. And, and I have constituent hours every month, and I'm always talking and meeting and emailing with folks. And so, you know, I've made a huge effort to really stay in touch and represent and understand my community and have that reflected in the actions that I take while I'm in office. Ultimately, though, you think that what you fostered was not necessarily compromise as much as empathy, tolerance, and and if not compromising in governing, what would you call your relationship with constituents that with whom you might disagree? Well, I think that I always had a sense that our values are shared values. You know, we we have these values and we manifest them in really different ways, whether it's around how we afford an education for all, our children or how we support our parents as they're aging. We just have really different ways of getting there and different ideas of how our government and our society is supposed to support these, these really critical parts of our life. And so you know, during, during my time in office, I've really, you know, I've worked with folks across the aisle. I've stayed in touch with my constituents. And I, you know, I think part of it is that when you're campaigning in a way that's based on building real relationships with people, we actually have like a normal relationship where you can agree to disagree and that you can have some trust in the other person so that when they do something that you might not agree with, you can say, oh, I bet, I bet Chloe had her reasons for doing that. And, um, you know, that's a huge part of how we campaign and how we build movements is having relationships that are strong enough and durable for that nuance, um, which is really desperately needed in our politics. Another thing that's been really important to me serving over the past four years has been uh, really prioritizing the people's voices and movements that are calling for change that are coming from communities that don't always have access to a legislative space, who can't take off of work in the middle of the day to drive to the state house or hop on Zoom to testify. And so my allegiance has been with those movements that are fighting for issues that are, are desperately needed in my community. My allegiance is not with my party, it's with my constituents. Canyon, as you look to advocating on behalf of rural voters into the future. Um, There is a candidate running to me who is part of our Rust Belt series after the 2016 election. We interviewed a number of mayors around the country and then Mayor Braddock, ultimately Lieutenant Governor, now he's running for the Senate, um, is someone who represents, I think a lot of the thrust of your book Um, in terms of his policy convictions, but also resonating with rural voters and a more multifaceted constituency of the electorate. Um, You know, how do you see Lieutenant Governor Fetterman's campaign in Pennsylvania? And uh, to extrapolate from the Senator's experience, what else are you looking at on the national horizon to instill those same values in in local and and state races around the country? I mean, Fetterman's got it right. He's, you know, his whole thing is I'm, I'm everywhere. I'm not just, I'm not just hanging out, dialing for, for dollars, trying to hang out with the richest people that I can every minute of the campaign to, to buy as many big TV ads in, in the big cities as I can. He's, he's loading up the, the campaign wagon and going, county to county through the entire state and 
having authentic gatherings with folks, talking to voters face to face and just being so authentic and accessible. Um, and I think that that's, you know, that's what we've tried to embody in, in our campaigns. And, and I think that that's, that's not the norm these days. Folks, folks feel like, oh, I'm not gonna drive out four hours to, to this county that, you know, votes 70% for Trump. That's just a waste of my time. Um, and, and we've been doing that for years and years. And, and the consequences of that, even if it's, even if it's just a, a few percentage points slide every election over the past, you know, 10 to 12 years, that's compounded into huge, huge losses. I think a lot of people don't realize that it wasn't that long ago that, that rural America was pretty evenly split as recently as 2009. The, the partisan lean of rural Americans was evenly split. And now it's a 16 point gap. And that kind of represents that few percentage points every cycle. And, and that's just killing us. But that's really interesting. You mentioned the 2008 election and analyzing those results and President Obama's success in places like Indiana. Uh, and of, of course, the, the Plains and, you know, making Missouri as competitive as it ever would be or will be in the eyes of, of contemporary progressives. But let me ask you this. It doesn't quite align with and, and it, in fact, it conflicts to an extent with this notion that when Americans are 18 years old or roughly right voting age or shortly thereafter drinking age, they form a consciousness that is almost immutable on the issue of taxes and on the issue of choice, abortion, reproductive rights, um, regardless of their gender, regardless of their zip code. Um, and I'd like you both to weigh in on this. First, Canyon, and then Chloe, do you agree that those two notions are kind of in conflict, the idea that for many decades, since before 2009, there has been a, a rural consciousness on a few issues that are hard to separate from everything else and that folks are gonna vote taxes and vote abortion. Um, and how do, you, how do you compute that um, with sort of the idealism that Dirt Road Revival is aspiring to, to say, look, we can have this open-ended interaction and coming sort of coming of age with a with a new um a new consciousness yeah i mean i think i think it's absolutely a reality that there's a you know there's a huge swath on both sides that um that is not going to move they're they're really fixed in place but there's a there's a big big chunk of folks who um who are less set in stone and and issues of course matter but what matters more i think is storytelling that reflects values and authenticity and being able to trust someone um and being able to go up against the establishment in both parties and um and try and shake things up and do things differently you know i think that's that was a big appeal of both Trump and Bernie um, in in rural America. You know, for I think for rural Americans, especially Washington or the state capital, feels very far away, distant, um, opaque, and they feel left behind, understandably, and forgotten. And and folks who are willing to come out and say what they think and challenge the establishment. Um, are really appealing. And, you know, even looking back to Obama's 2008 campaign, um, he, he used a lot of that rhetoric as, as well and, and seemed really set on, on bringing change to the system. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the first thing that comes to mind when, when I hear that question is just really recognizing that, that you know, the fact that um, abortion is such a key issue in elections or that taxes are just such a key word that every candidate has to use. That's not by accident. It's not a random manifestation of human behavior. It's, uh, it's a, 
it's a planned agenda that the right as an institution has been putting forth for decades. I was just reading the other day about how in the 1990s, Newt Gingrich, who was the Republican whip in, in the House, you know, put out this paper about how language can be a, a way to control the elections and the way people think. And so much of the language that we see in our po political rhetoric every day came from, you know, this, this paper that he wrote. And one of the one of the words that he wanted associated with the Democrats was taxes. And so, you know, this has been something that has been created. It's been created by a very substantial right-wing agenda. And it's also been created by the lack of a democratic apparatus in rural America, um, you know, and, and it's been dwindling. And so what we see is that, well, what if you can fight back against that in a way that's meaningful, that allows space for that reality. We're not going to overturn decades of, of any political agenda in, in, in even the next 10 years. But what we can do is, you know, I, I kind of think of it as the two sides are pushing in on each other and we're just trying to jump in there and hold the doors open before they just totally shut. And I don't think there's any other way to do that in this moment in time besides really revol revolutionizing the way that campaigns are run from school board races all the way up to the presidential. Yeah, I do wonder what happened during that transition from Chairman Dean to Chairman Kane. I think that was the succession because Dean's focus was on 50 states and every single county and township and whatever, right? And, and something got lost. And maybe it was the fact that President Obama did not govern as an economic populist. And we see the consequence of what I've long talked about on this program as cannibal capitalism. Um, and that, uh, and that's just a functional reality that liberals are not, not willing to accept, um, you know, to a, to a degree, but Fetterman would, if you put him on the spot. And certainly when I interviewed him, he would acknowledge that reality that, um, you were, the, the, you were sort of the pros of Obama's campaign was populism, but the governing was not. Um, and, you know, to my, my question to you, Chloe, grappling with your, your uh, work together, the book and launching that on the road now, you know, is on the tax issue first, you're in a pickle as someone who is arguing, um, you know, in, in, the, in the position of investment, you know, or maybe taxation through um, investment in your communities. Because for many years, ages now, it seems like federal candidates, Republican candidates for high office have been, wet in, in, in essence, using that issue um, and being elected on an anti-tax platform when they get to Congress, they have no control over the kinds of taxation issues that you grapple with at the local level, uh, whether that's property tax or other you know, municipal taxes. So there's election cycle after election cycle where that's used as a wedge or a weapon. Uh, and then at the end of the day, Senator McConnell, for example, if he turns majority leader, he's not gonna be able to control property taxes in New Jersey or for that matter in, in Maine where you are. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've, I've knocked 20,000 doors in my community in the past two cycles. And the by far the biggest issue that I heard from people was that they didn't feel like the people that they elected actually represented them. People would say one thing on the campaign trail and then either not do anything once they were in office or do the total opposite. And so, you know, I think it's that gap between the promises that are made in these conversations, which make those conversations not authentic, the gap between those conversations and how people act in office have had a really destructive impact on constituents' confidence in our democracy and like the, the facticity of just voting. And so I think, you know, what, what I've done is just kind of be honest about it. You know, if like, if I'm going to get into office, I can't control what folks do on the federal level and the federal level um, in many cases, like you just said, doesn't have control over how our property taxes shake out. And I, I think we need space for that nuance in our politics that's often really, really lost. 
you know, and like another example is I've always voted to, to raise taxes on the most wealthy folks in our society, but I have not re voted for re regressive tax policy. So also having these like really broad strokes ways that we're talking about these issues limits us from actually making the kinds of reforms that we need. And um, as an organizer many years ago, I was like, there should be no nuance in politics. Some issues are just so black and white. Um, and that's and that's still true. But I think that we can't have that space for that nuance, for the complexity of the issues that we're facing without that basic trust between voter and elected official. Now, when you think of abortion and the overturning of Roe and its consequences for, for your work going forward, not just in your district, but nationally, what's your current approach? You know, I think what's happening with abortion right now in this country is just, is just genuinely, it's genuinely terrifying. I mean, there are, there are very few words to express the horror of the situation that we're in. I think it is, you know, also on, on some level, a manifestation of the power of the rural conservative vote that elected Trump and led to these very conservative Supreme Court justices being appointed. And now we are paying, we're paying the price for that mistake, you know, for countless years. And uh, I think it just really reinforces the need to really dig into rural America and, and have these conversations. Um, because right now the power is going to fall to to states to really protect people's bodies. And that's going to require pro-choice um, candidates to, to get elected. And that's not going to happen without the deep canvassing and the empathetic listening that that we're talking about. So I think it's it's at least for me really reinforced the fire that I have to do this work and have and have these really tough conversations instead of just letting it all pass us by. Kenya? Yeah, I mean, totally agree with all of that. I think, I think the Dobbs decision and also the attempt at a coup in 2020 and the, you know, the foundation that's being set right now to, to contest um, a democratic election in 2024, both really drive home the importance of state level politics because um, in both cases there's there's a really good chance that it's going to come down ultimately to the state legislatures to to hold the line on access to abortion um, and similarly on on not bowing to the pressures of of the trump gang on on fake electors and and overturning an election you know we're facing an, an existential threat to our democracy in 2024 and state legislatures are the key to holding holding the line and i think a lot of people are starting to pick up on that so so that is is the one shred of hope that i take from it all to close let me just ask you both what is the most misunderstood thing about rural america i think the there's probably a lot that i'm not that's not coming to my mind right now there is a lot but I think yeah. this there's this narrative that rural Americans are voting against their their own best interest, and um, I think that's just a really dangerous way to look at rural America. It kind of cuts us off from having an honest conversation in the first place when you come in with that judgment, and it also just makes folks in rural places feel kind of looked down upon, and it it doesn't really uh, create the kind of empathetic space that we need to to stop these huge divides from tearing us apart. Well said, can you? Yeah, I mean, high-speed internet is, is huge and we're not talking about that enough. I, <laughs> I had to find a, a, a friend's house to do this interview in because I don't have access to high-speed internet um, where I live in the mountains of North Carolina. And that's just, that is, it should be like phone, phone lines. You know, everybody should have a right to easy access to internet. You need it for school starting as early as, as middle school these days and for for jobs and economic opportunity. It's, it's just, it, it's really messed up. Um, and then I think as far as what people don't understand about, about rural folks, I mean, so much, there's, there's so many stereotypes and there's just a huge, a huge gap there. I think that um, rural, rural folks have a beautiful way of life. It's what's called me home. 
it's centered in values of independence, but also interdependence in a small, small town community where folks care about each other and look out for each other. Um, and I think that that's really beautiful. And I think that having rural folks in our policy discussions is so, so important to, to bring those values there and, and thinking about climate change, for example, as we, as we navigate the changing world, do we want, you know, Tesla driving technocrats creating all of our policy, or, or do we want the folks that are intimately connected with the land and growing our food and um, catching our fish in those discussions? So, um, Canyon, yeah. thank you so much for your insight, Chloe, to you as well. Um, Co authors of Dirt Road Revival How to Rebuild Rural Politics and Why Our Future Depends on It, Chloe Maxman and Canyon Woodward. Thank you both for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash Open Mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.